You're listening to the Dear Baseball Gods podcast. I'm Dan Blewett, and on this show, you'll learn advanced concepts in baseball explained simply. I'm here to guide you on your baseball journey and help you paddle through what's now an ocean of misinformation, guruism, and overly technical diamond babble. Welcome back to the Dear Baseball Gods podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. This is episode 98, and today's episode, we're going to cover number one, year-round throwing. What does that look like? Obviously, uh, right now, it's the fall, so hopefully you're listening to this episode in September, October. Uh, If you're not, it'll still be relevant next year, but it's a great time to talk about what you should be doing in the fall, and should you be tapering down your throwing, should you be taking a break, all that sort of stuff, so we'll cover that today. We're also going to cover a major change-up myth, which is, do you have to have big hands to throw a change-up effectively? I just listened to a youth baseball podcast. I heard a pitching guy perpetuating this myth, so we're going to kind of come back at him here. Uh, And lastly, let's talk about pickoffs. Pickoffs are overlooked, underrated, something that needs to be practiced. Okay, so first thing, if you're a parent or if you're an athlete and you're a pitcher or your son is a pitcher, throwing and your year-long throwing regimen is important. It's important to map out your year and understand when you're going to take breaks, when you're not, what you want to do, and also sort of like, you know, maybe what might be unique about the way you throw, the way you train, about your body. Some players need more rest than others. Some players who play multiple sports have different, um, you know, they kind of have rest built into their year. So lots of different things to cover. But first thing to talk about, number one, if you're not aware of this resource, the ASMI, which is the American Sports Medicine Institute, they've teamed up with Major League Baseball. They have a website called uh, Pitch Smart. And on the Pitch Smart website, which you can just Google this, I'll also put the link in the in the show notes. Um, the pitch smart website gives you information about pitching injuries and, uh, injury factors. So it explains all the different things that contribute to injury that they've found through their extensive research in the last couple of decades on, on baseball players. So if you're not aware of that, that's should be always your goal, your go-to. There's a lot of disinformation on the web. There's a lot of ways it can be muddied. Um, I'm going to muddy it just a hair here today, but in general, I follow those rules and I think they're all very, very sound. They're done by lots and lots of smart researchers. And so that's definitely your, your research. Now, when I say I'm going to muddy it a little bit, the only thing I'm going to push back on, uh, so they recommend that every player take two to three months off of throwing every year. And they're somewhat unclear about what exactly off means. And so this is what I want to, again, I'm not saying I'm muddying it, but I want you to think about what off really means for a thrower. So they mean off from competitive throwing. And typically the recommendation is two, three months completely off. So like not throwing a ball at all. Now, I think athletes are capable. I think baseball players are capable of throwing year round if they so choose, but they are certainly not capable of competitive pitching year round. So if you're competitively pitching in the spring and then you're competitively pitching in the summer and then you're pretty much done for the year, but you still want to like play shortstop and you want to play catch and you're going to play backyard baseball and, you know, go play catch with your dad a couple days a week, whatever. I don't see any reason that that's going to contribute to long-term injury. Another research has been studying that they've been doing research on competitive pitching and players that pitch more than a hundred years or a hundred innings combined a year or at a much higher injury rate and players that competitively pitch year round. So that means they're competitively pitching for their spring team, summer team, fall team, maybe even a winter team if they're in California, Texas, or Arizona, you know, one of the warm weather states. So that's the big distinction. So I don't think players and, and parents need to be afraid of picking up a ball in November, December, January, if they so choose. And, you know, taking ground balls, throwing them across the infield, playing catch, you know, spinning a breaking ball at half speed while working on, you know, or working on their new change up by playing catch. So I just think there's, you need to know what phase you're entering in. And there's a good period of time, and this is probably it in the fall and winter before you start to ramp back up, 
where it's fine to play catch a lot and again throw your change up throw your curveball do all these things but in a completely non-competitive setting like you're just going to stretch it out a little bit come back in and spin some of these you know off speed pitches and have, to have a little flat ground and throw it half speed three quarter speed and just throw but not come anywhere close to, to to blowing it out and going full speed so i think one of the analogies that people use is runners a lot of people who are competitive runners or just very avid runners they pretty much don't like to take time off like their body feels better when they stay in the routine and they're always getting their three runs in a week or five runs in a week or whatever and they sort of just like feel rickety when they take a week off or take two weeks off or take a month back or take a month off and then come back and I think there is something to be said for that. I think that there is something um, like greasing the groove, so to speak. Like weightlifters have the same thing. Like they feel like, you know, competitive powerlifters and weightlifters, they they squat a lot. And they feel like if they're, con- you know, r- continuing to squat regularly, their hips stay mobile. Like everything just like kind of stays in line. And I would say that throwing feels the same way too. It's It's kind of rough coming back after a couple months solid off and... Now, I, I do think, again, this needs to be taken into context. So, you know, if you're a young player and you threw 25 competitive innings in the summer, which if you're not a prime pitcher on your team, if you're just like a reliever or you're just on a, a not hyper competitive team, you might only throw 25 innings in the spring and then maybe like 20 innings in the summer. You know, so it's not like you've been overused where you should absolutely not touch a ball you are probably fine to, again, just like keep playing catch and throw the ball across the infield, take ground balls, just like do baseball things and don't pitch and perfectly fine. If you're someone like me, where after my rookie season of baseball, of pro ball, I threw more innings in one summer than I had in the previous three years combined in college. And that was also partly because I was injured a lot, but I think I threw a hundred, like 130 innings. My, my, uh, which isn't even that many in the grand scheme of things. Like most minor leaguers who are starters will get to 150 or 160 a lot of times. But I threw like 120 innings or 130 innings my um, rookie year. And that was like 22 straight starts or something. I had never done that before. And my arm was not feeling great at that last start. So I did take two solid months off from throwing. My body was exhausted. I needed to recover. Um, and that was my choice. And I feel like that was the best choice for me. Like I just was like mentally and physically ready to just like get the ball away from me. And some of your kids are probably like that too. And if you're a pitcher out there listening, you've probably been in that situation too. I know some high schoolers, you know, you play your high school season, then you go right into your summer season. Then you might have a bunch of showcases and you might rack up 75 innings in that, in that period of time, or hopefully not more, but certainly possibly more. And so you might be like, yeah, I'm ready to just like get off me ball take a couple months and just not even think about throwing a baseball and that's totally fine too so obviously any anyone who's been in the game for a long time is going to say you know listen to your body listen to the experts and do what you think is logical and reasonable and i think this is just the thing everyone needs to come back at every year and, and kind of audit what you've done for the season for the year and say all right we've we've thrown a lot how does your body feel little timmy I feel actually pretty good. Like, you know, we, yeah, I pitched a lot, but you know, I feel like we got a bunch of rest. We had some vacation weeks in the middle and we had a couple, you know, we had like a month break between seasons and, you know, look at their workload and, and make an informed decision. And then there's other kids where they might feel like they're raring to go, but they really did throw too much and they really do need some time off. So there's lots of things to consider. And so my overarching um, point here is make logical choices don't feel like you you absolutely should not be playing competitive baseball for three seasons a year so if you're playing spring ball and summer ball don't play fall ball fall ball just sucks it just sucks it just sucks as a player it heats your arm back up and you pitch once a week for like two three innings in meaningless games it's just a waste it's it's better if you're a position player if you need to get some at bats stuff like that this year with coronavirus I certainly understand the utility because guys pretty much missed a whole season. So they're making up, you know, some innings, but in general, I think it's best to just plan to not do fall ball. 
And and here's my thing with fall ball and with that essentially maybe like the third season of the year is that you end up just, okay, fall ball, not a rigorous schedule, right? Maybe you only play like eight games in four weeks or eight games in eight weeks. Like you just play a doubleheader on the weekends or something like that. But as a pitcher, if you're going to pitch in these, you still have to like keep your arm in shape. You can't just, oh, it's fall ball. I'm just going to pitch two innings on Sunday. So I'm just going to play catch once during the week and then pitch my two innings. That's terrible for your arm. So the, 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 the hazard with fall ball is a lot of people let down their guard and they think, oh, it's just like halftime. I'm just going to, you know, play pick up basketball through the week and do whatever and then just like show up the field and play ball. If you're going to be a if you're going to be competitively pitching in any sense, in any volume, you have to keep your arm in shape. And this is what I had to always implore to my guys. Like, look, if you're going to play fall ball, OK, but you need to still throw four or five days a week to keep your arm in shape. You can't just, again, show up on Sunday and go throw full speed for three innings and expect your arm to be all right with it. You know, as a 15 year old, your body's kind of okay with everything, but it's going to definitely accumulate some wear and tear and that's not good. So pitchers need to maintain shape throughout every single season that they're in. And this is another stipulation. So as a parent, if you're, your son wants to play fall ball and he wants to pitch, you have to say, okay, but are you going to be able to commit to throwing four or five days a week to keep your arm in shape? Cause you cannot just throw once during the week and then show up on Sunday and pitch. And this almost sounds counterintuitive, right? Like, Oh, so Dan, you're now advocating that they throw five days a week. Absolutely. And that's, you know, you're going to play catch on Tuesday. You're going to long toss, stretch it out a little bit on Wednesday. You're going to throw a bullpen on Thursday. You're going to take off on Friday. You're going to play catch on Saturday and then you're going to pitch on Sunday. That's a normal routine. Your arm needs that amount of conditioning. And again, none of that is like hard full speed work by any means. Those are two catch days, a bullpen day and a long toss day. All, all of those are pretty much below full speed not pretty much they are you know a bullpen day is a 75 percent effort day a long toss day is like a an easy loose but stretch it out maybe out to like 75 percent 90 percent day and then catch is like 50 to 70 percent so those things are necessary so when you're committing to competitive pitching in any sense you have to commit to keeping your arm in shape which means at least four days a week of throwing and really more realistically five or six most pitchers don't take off more than one or two days a week certainly not two days a week. And usually guys will have just one day off a week. Cause again, like it's greasing the groove, so to speak, if you're a machine, you know, you have to have those catch days and your arm doesn't really feel better when you have multiple off days a week. And again, I'm just talking about playing catch, like just throwing the ball. So these are all factors to consider. So your year round throwing number one, again, taking time off from competitive pitching is critical. So again, it doesn't mean you have to completely not throw a ball at all for three, two or th- three or four months, but you do have to stop competitive pitching. So pick two seasons, make it spring and summer, and then take fall off from competitive pitching. If you want to play fall ball, okay, just do it as a position player only. And if you're going to pitch, you have to keep your arm in shape. Um, second uh, item here, um, other sports, you know, especially if you're below the age where you haven't committed to just baseball yet. Cause I do think there's an age where you need to commit to just baseball. It's probably 16 years old. Um, you know, if you play other sports, they're a great way to build in fitness and other activities, you know, other, you know, forms of team culture and camaraderie and, and hard work and toughness, all that stuff. So for the kids that play football in the fall, wonderful for the guys that can throw the football around, you know, great. That's a, it's a different implement. I think that's good for your arm. You're not throwing a full a football, 92 miles per hour. You know, you throw a football, it's like a 75% effort, 90% effort, uh, kind of throw and it's heavier and it's just different. And I think it's stimulating and healthy in your, for your arm in just a different way. So I think other sports are great. They build in some of that rest because they just make you too busy with the other sport to play too much baseball or to be out there on the competitive field. Again, uh, either you have to stay hot or you have to go down again. That's just, I'm going to keep beating this point out, beating it to death and that you have to keep your arm in shape if you're going to play. Um, and lastly, again, just think a little bit more about the analogy. I think there's a lot of human movements and activities that when you do it consistently, your body says, this is good. I want to keep doing it consistently, even if it's just a low level. So even though you might 
not be running competitive 5Ks, you know, just going out on a nice, easy, you know, easy, easy jog is going to kind of keep your legs, you know, feeling a little bit better than taking that, that complete time off. So year round throwing, um, you do need to plan out your year. It's really, really important. Make sure you have some, some downtime from competitive pitching and, uh, just be sensible with it. Sit down with your son once a year, if not more, again, audit what they've been doing. See, ask them how their body feels, really take a hard look at the overall volume of throwing and pitching for the year and just make sensible choices for the future. Okay, so let's talk about a, a change-up myth that irks me. People say that you really can't teach a change-up to kids with small hands. So I'm just going to say that, look, I've taught change-ups to kids of all shapes and sizes, of all ages, and they do just fine. They just they just do fine when you're competent and actually good at teaching the change-up. So this comes back to, uh, you know, there's a, I reference a story in pitch calling a lot where a teammate was who didn't throw as hard as I did, didn't have as good a fastball as I did. He was talking about how to pitch to this one hitter who was, he thought kind of, was kind of dangerous. And he said, yeah, you know, you can't really throw this guy fastballs. And to me, I was saying, yeah, you can't, I can. This is a, this is a similar scenario. So I heard this other guy who I'd never heard of before on another youth baseball podcast talking about, you know, why changeups essentially aren't good for youth players. And one of his reasons was that they have small hands so they just can't throw them very well. Well, it's like, yeah, you just can't teach it apparently, whoever you are. Um, but I can teach kids to throw a great changeup even with the small hands. And look, the thing is this, the changeup is not this complex grip where it has to be choked deep in your hand or you have to wrap your fingers around the ball. Absolutely not. All you have to do is get your thumb underneath it, which any human hand is capable of doing. And then you just need to put your two fingers together, get them on top of the ball. And then your goal is to sort of pronate inward on it and get this angled tumbling sort of disco ball spin, um, which is a great new term I learned uh, recently. And that's uh, it's coined by one of uh, Barton Smith's um, researchers over at the uh, one of his assistants, I think, um, in the uh, Utah State University uh, aerodynamics lab. So the way a disc, disco ball uh, spins is a, is exactly pretty much how I've been teaching my change up on my YouTube channel. So if you're not familiar with that video and you want to learn a change up or you want to help teach someone a change up, definitely check that out. But the thing w with change ups is that they used to be taught in this nebulous, ambiguous way where there's like a million different grips and you just tinker until you find one. No one really knows why a change up goes slower. It just does. You know, you talk to five different pitching coaches, they threw their chain to five different ways. And my goal was always to say, this is stupid. Well, that wasn't my goal. That's what I was saying. I said, this is stupid. We need to find a repeatable way to teach this just like we do the curveball. You know, you have a couple different grips you can use the curveball, but they're really just finger placements. They're not really just different grips. And we're all trying to get the same top spin, this like clean, fast spinning top spin to a curveball. That's what a curveball is. A slider also has a pretty predefined set of spin characteristics that make it a slider. And so I'm like, why is the change of not the same way? In reality, especially the way the change of has been evolving, because more and more major leaguers are throwing this sort of disco ball, angled spinning, tumbling change up. That's a little bit faster than the traditional one that has heavy sink and arm side run. It's a pitch that all you really have to do is get your thumb on the bottom of the ball two fingers on top, you know, the way, the exact orientation of those fingers can vary. And they just have to push down on the inside of the ball as you're releasing it. So it's, it's essentially not that different from a fastball release, except you're getting on the inside. Like you're, if you have a, a can of Coke in your hand right now and you're pouring it out, that's pronation. And you're just essentially pronating on the inside of the ball a little bit early. The hand size doesn't really make a difference on that because whether your hands are big or small, the ball is going to roll out of your fingers towards your tips. And then as you pronate on the inward of it, on the inside of it, that's when you're going to apply the spin. So your fingers don't really matter. Like your finger length does not matter. And I've taught a lot of little guys who are under five foot with small hands, you know, the, the size of hand you'd expect from a five foot kid. And they've thrown chain ups that sink and look great for being 50 miles per hour. I typically don't teach change ups to kids below 
I was typically 12 because at that age, like it's just like not necessary. It's just, they're better off just throwing fastballs and just locating and just being comfortable with pitching. They just don't really need a second pitch. So typically it was 12 when I teach the first, uh, first changeup, but I never had an issue and I never even considered it a handicapped. And that's some of the things, that's one of the things I think we do in life where it's when someone says, Oh, you can't do this because of this. And you're like, Oh, okay. And you automatically make this artificial gate for yourself. Whereas I never thought as an instructor that hand size had anything to do with teaching a changeup. So it just never even occurred to me. So it's just like, all right, let's get to work. Let's teach you this changeup. Never even thought that, oh, this kid's got his hands too small to learn this. So be careful out there. There's certainly misinformation. And if you've heard that myth before that your hand size, finger size matters on a changeup, ignore it. All right, last on the docket today, let's talk about pickoffs. So pickoffs are one of the most underrated things. Like players need to know them. It's uh, always a little bit shocking to me how few players know the proper pickoffs to second base and have a good pickoff to first base. I mean, these are, they're not pivotal things in every game. Like you're not going to get in every game where a pickoff is going to make or break you, right? You're not going to pick off more than a handful of runners a year as a righty. I mean, as a, as a pro guy, a pro righty starter, you'll pick off one or two guys a year tops. And that's lucky if you just happen to catch them guessing, guessing. And that's really just random, really just random chance. If you just pick off to, to first base a hundred times in the summer, you're going to catch a guy leaning the wrong way and make a good throw, you know, once and just get lucky. That's really all it is. Um, but being able to hold the runners, um, Yikes, I just said hold the runners. <laughs> Being able to hold runners and keep them at second base, don't let them steal third base with one out, don't let them steal second base with no one out where they can just then manufacture runs. That's important stuff. And also just having the ability to make good fakes and to figure out when a guy's bunting. And, and those are more of like the second base pickoff moves. So my overarching point here today is just that people don't practice pickoffs. They just really don't. And it's something that you learn it in practice and you do it and it's boring and it's tedious and you know you have to do it in games a lot of pitchers don't like picking the bases i didn't particularly like it and so you you end up just getting like this this bare minimum dose like it's like your algebra class that you you took it in seventh grade or eighth grade and then you just never wanted to and so then you never even thought about algebra again like you didn't have to take more algebra so you didn't and that's kind of how pickoffs are but I'd like people to rethink this and I urge all the kids that I work with to, to like, look, just, just spend five minutes a week, like during your, your catch play, when you're playing catch with your buddies before practice or before a game, just spend four pickoffs, just four throws, make them pick off. So, you know, face the other direction, do two spin moves, do one inside move and do a couple uh, pickoffs to first base. Like just do it as part of your routine, semi-regularly, or go out when you're playing catch with your dad and just turn away from him. Then just act like you're pitching you know, the other direction and and then act like you're picking to first and he becomes first base. Uh, just add this to your routine. It doesn't have to be a huge, like don't make it, you know, 50, go, let's go do 50 pickoffs at the park. Like that's boring. No one wants to do that. But just add it to part of your routine. So especially when I worked with lefty pitchers, this was a th something we, I always did with lefties and I wasn't even a lefty, but I'm like, look, we're going to teach you a good hang move and a good snap throw. The younger you are, the more inappropriate the snap throw is, but it's something to learn to get comfortable with. The snap throw is the one where you step off rapidly and you throw like a, like a, sh uh, you throw like a sidearm throw to first base. It's a very all in one motion throw. And most kids don't ever learn it because it's more of like a, a college pro kind of move, but there's no reason a 12 year old can't have that move. He just has to practice it and he doesn't have as much arm strength to kind of snap, throw that ball over there. But my point is that for my lefties, I just beat it into their brains that you have to have a good pickoff move. It's just, it's a shame and it's a waste. If you're a lefty without a good pickoff move, it's purely effort. It's purely just showing up and doing the move regularly. And for the two lefties on my 15 U team who practice their moves like semi-religiously like they're going to do five or six pickoffs every time we play catch as a team they picked off like eight guys each each for the summer like 
one kid picked off three runners in the same game. And uh, I, don't, I don't think we got an out any of them that game. Um, that's besides the point. But, I mean, these are 15-year-old kids with dirty, legitimately good pickoff moves. And it wasn't because they were special. It wasn't because they were talented. It was because they showed up and it was part of their workout. It was part of their throwing routine and they worked on it. You know, and they gave each other feedback on, on you know, how deceptive they were. And so even if you're a righty, this is something that can be part of your routine where, you know, you, you go through your mechanics, you go through your drills, you come back in, you spin your curveball, you spin your change up, you know, your partner gets down, you throw a couple fastballs to each knee, and then you turn away and you do two first base pickoff moves to them. Then you turn even farther. You do two spin moves, act like, acting like your partner's second baseman. Then you do one inside move and do the same thing there. So again, this is a critical component of being a good pitcher, and it takes nothing more than just a little bit of effort. And to have a, a move that's significantly better than your peers means you will get more runners than them because your move will be abnormally good and it'll surprise runners. Like they'll be used to the average crappy pickoff move, but then you mosey long and boom, yours is like very quick and fast and you make more accurate throws than your peers because you make more throws in practice. It's a very underrated thing. So I'm going to stop there. I hope you enjoyed the show today and please go do some pickoff moves. Well, that's it for today's episode of Dear Baseball Gods. If you enjoy the show and would like to support me while improving your baseball IQ, buy one of my books or enroll today in an online pitching course. Sign up for any of my courses through the links in the show notes and save 20% with code BASEBALLGODS just for being a listener. My online courses walk you through pitching mechanics, strategy, learning new pitches, and mental skills training. They're start to finish an amazing solution for pitchers, parents, and coaches who want step-by-step -step instruction. Pitching Isn't Complicated, my first book, is a thorough pitching manual with strategy, pitch grips, mechanics, mindset, routines, and other high-level pitching concepts. Not sure what your son is in for if he falls in love with the game? Dear Baseball Gods, the book is my memoir, a story of growing up in the game, persevering through injuries and setbacks, and struggling with identity when I finally had to clean out my locker. Buy a copy today via the links in the show notes, available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook if you just can't get enough of my voice. Be sure to subscribe to my weekly email list where you'll get updates on all my new videos and episodes. Nearly 4,000 people get my emails, and you should too. Sign up through the link in the show notes. Lastly, who do you know who can use some good advice? Please share this podcast with a friend, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and subscribe to my YouTube channel where you'll find this podcast and hundreds of baseball instructional videos. As always, hustle and stay pious. I'm Dan Blewett, and I'll see you next time.